that uh, we've got some experience in the room and a lot of people that are ready to learn about a new topic and we're very um, delighted. Thanks, Costa. So I'm going to stop sharing uh, this poll. Um, and before I uh, put myself on mute uh, and sit in the background, I would just like to remind you that we're recording this session uh, for it later playback. So you'll get the, the recording. Uh, and also because we're going to use it uh, uh, for, um, to produce additional outputs from, uh, from this uh, um, event. Um, with this, uh, I think I'm going to just mute myself, handing over to Constance, who's going to be our main facilitator together with Sabrina. Um, and um, we get going through the program. Thank you, Constance. Over to Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Pierre. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. And I know we have some people on different time zones. So good morning. Good evening. Welcome very much to the SADC Futures Training Series. My name is Constance Neely. I am with the CCAFS team and uh, will be serving as one of your trainers and facilitators. We're very happy that you are all here with us today for the Foresight Training, where we hope to really develop skills and capacities for applying foresight for climate resilient agricultural development. Now, just a bit about how this series came about. The training is an initiative of the SADC Food and Agriculture Natural Resources, Banner Directorate, and the Center for Coordination of Agricultural Research and Development, CARDESA. It is being implemented by the CGIAR Research Program on Climate Change, Agriculture, and Food Security. That's CCAPS for short. It's being facilitated through the GIZ Adaptation to Climate Change in Rural Areas, ACRA program within the German Development Corporation and with funding from the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ. So when we want to thank uh, the all of the partners and the donors for helping us make this series come alive. So, uh, Pierre, how many people do we have in the room? At the moment, we've got uh, uh, 70 attendees plus, uh, plus the panelists and the support That's team, 71. So people are still coming in. So we're a total of 80 at the moment between panelists and attendees. Uh, but I see that people are still coming in. Okay, so wonderful. probably we'll get a few more as we, um, as we move along with the webinar. So at this moment, we'd like to actually invite you to one more poll. Uh, we'd like to understand um, if Pierre can share the poll. We'd like to understand um, from where you are coming in terms of the category of your work or your daily life. Um, and we would invite you to choose one that describes you. Yeah, vote, votes are coming in. And I take this opportunity also to um, remind people that when, as Lily also put it in the chat, when you use the chat, please make sure that you select the option to write to all attendees. Um, there are different options in the two field that you can select. Uh, and if you uh, have trouble or uh, um, any technical issue, you can also chat to me privately. So you can check, you can select my name in the list uh, of, uh, in the two field. Uh, and so that will be a private chat. Uh, but in general for public chat, let's make sure you use all panelists and attendees. I hope everybody is still uh, has good sound. If not, you can try to increase uh, the volume uh, on your headset or on the uh, laptop itself. Um, we've got 80% of votes, um, 
uh, in those po in this poll. So I'm gonna end it end it in uh, three, two, one. So the poll is now closed, um, and I'm gonna share the result. You should all be able to see those. Okay. Very good. Look at this. So we've actually got quite a good uh, distribution across the different categories. So, um, but now our highest is coming from research uh, and academia and local and national government. We're delighted. And also um, the NGO and CBO community. And we're happy to have colleagues coming in particularly um, our farmers organizations, pastoralist, fisher, and forester organizations, our intergovernmental organizations, and private sector, and of course, our development partners. So thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure to, to get a sense of where you are all coming from. And um, so with that, uh, now that we know a bit more about who's in the room, uh, I would very much like to take this opportunity to have our official welcome. And that is uh, my great pleasure to, to invite Dr. Simon Mwale. And Dr. Mwale is the Programs and Grant, Grants Manager at Cardessa. And he will be giving us a few brief opening remarks. Welcome, Dr. Mwale. Dr. Mwale, over, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Mwale. Dr. Mwale, we look forward to your um, welcoming remarks now. Thank you. Uh, you can't hear us. Um, can I think you we should be able to hear him. Okay. The microphone is open. Please go ahead. I think we can hear you, Dr. Marley. We can hear your typing. So I think if you if you go ahead, we should be able to hear you loud and clear. I think he's having difficulty hearing us. Um, yeah, I think, I think he cannot hear us. Um, well, we were just doing it before, we were doing a test just before the session and everything was Good well. Good afternoon. Please. Perfect. Can you hear me? Because yes. I can't hear you from the other side, but I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And, um, First, I would like to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. This is a very important training session and we greatly appreciate your spa uh, sparing time to join the, the meeting. I would also like to apologize on behalf of the Executive Director of CADESA, Dr. Dlamini, who unfortunately could not be with you this afternoon to say a few words at the beginning of this uh, webinar session. 
unfortunately he had uh, a sudden issue to attend to and that's why he asked me to do the remarks on his behalf moving forward let me start by recognizing fully the participation and the commitment of our partners who we have worked with for a long time we have worked with them along this path and they're still with us and we have the promise that they'll be working with us into the future there are many partners that we work with but allow to mention just a few first of all the sadic secretariat specifically the Food, Agriculture and Natural Resources Directorate, which has been very instrumental from the past up to today, and they are our important partner going forward. I would also like to recognize the International Livestock Research Institute through the CGAIAR Research Program on Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security, CCAPS in short, who also have been a pillar in this journey. And then the German Development Corporation, uh, who are facilitated through the SADIC GIZ Adaptation to Climate Change in Rural Areas, ACRA program, which is implemented jointly between GIZ, ACRA, and ourselves. And also, uh, I need to recognize the contribution, the financial contribution of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we all know that uh, the agricultural environment is a very unpredictable and sometimes can be a very harsh environment. It is not something that is short of uncertainties. At each one given time, the agricultural sector is faced with a very unpredictable situation. Of late, the issue of climate change is the one that poses the highest risk to agricultural production and marketing to such an extent that the risk associated with the production of agricultural products at the primary level is extremely high at the moment. And this is because uh, one of the key factors is the scarcity of uh, water for crop production and for watering of animals. And then the, the situation has been very fluid in the past few years. If you look at Southern Africa, for example, it's one of those vulnerable regions of the world. Cyclones and flooding are now becoming very, very frequent. I think we are all aware of uh, the cyclones that hit Southern Africa in the last uh, rain season. Cyclone Idai and uh, Cyclone Kenneth hitting the uh, Mozambique, the Zimbabwe, parts of Tanzania and Malawi. Lives were lost, crops were lost, livestock were lost. Can I say just the livelihoods of the rural people were lost. And these are vulnerable uh, communities where if they lose even just six or seven animals, it is a very big loss and it accounts for a very big change in their livelihoods. Associated with the uh, climate change is also outbreaks of uh, plant and animal diseases that are becoming more frequent in the region. You saw, uh, for example, the last uh, growing season, the outbreak of locusts in East Africa, which uh, caused a lot of devastation to the crops of the farmers. And remember, these are farmers, again, who are very, very vulnerable, a loss of a crop can mean a lot of uh, losses to that uh, household. As if that is not enough, we've had the uh, COVID-19, which hit globally everywhere, starting from China, it is now throughout the world. That just added an extra dimension on the vulnerable situation in the agricultural 
And at the moment, because of some lockdowns where, which were imposed, it is very difficult for the farmers like in Southern Africa where the season has come to an end and they're supposed to go into marketing, it's very difficult for the farmers now to transport their products to the market. As a result, uh, there is that shift or change now uh, going into new priorities to try to bring um, resilience and to try to minimize the impact of the COVID-19. So we are living in a situation where the agricultural environment is extremely uh, vulnerable. But uh, sitting down and crying over the environment and crying over COVID-19 is not adequate. That's not what we need to do now. We need to be looking at uh, what actions can be taken to minimize the impacts. And especially things like uh, climate change because we have an opportunity now to look into the future, to try to see how can we increase our understanding of the potential uh, impacts of climate change to agriculture. And at the same time, we can use the foresighting to try to uh, devise strategies that will make the future for agriculture more predictable and a little bit more manageable for us. In fact, for citing, we are looking at how best we can participate in shaping the future so that we do not react to situations when they, when they come. We should be part and parcel of that shaping process for the future. So we are dealing with a very important issue, very important uh, aspect of foresighting, and that is why at Cadesa we are extremely uh, excited and ex extremely happy that our partners have come together with us to work and look at uh, how we can assist with the situation. At Cadesa we've prioritized the issue of uh, climate change, and we have a specific theme within our strategic plan that deals with uh, climate change and uh, a outbreak of transboundary pests and diseases, and also looking at the environment. This is because CADESA attaches great importance uh, to issues that will shape the agricultural environment in the near future. And in this regard, I need to recognize that we've been working with uh, different organizations. We are currently implementing a few projects. We are implementing a project called CADIP XP4 together with other organizations in Africa, like Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa. We are also collaborating with ASAREKA in East Africa, AFAS at the continental level, as well as uh, CORAF. We are also having the project which I, I mentioned earlier on, the other project supported by GIZ. We've been with this project since 2016 and it has done a lot of work and would like to see a situation where we build on what we have done going forward together with the, the other partners. Then to end uh, my remarks on behalf of the executive director, I would like to encourage all the participants. And I noted that uh, most of the participants are new to the issue. We at CADESA, together with our partners, CCAFs, GIZ, SADIC, and others, we strongly believe that these training sessions will be extremely beneficial in our works, whether we are from the academic background or from the public sector, the ministries of agriculture, whether we're from the universities, from whatever background you are from, we strongly believe this training will be very, very useful. And together, once we go through this training, together in the future, we should be able to deliver good results to our farmers. So it is our appeal to all the participants to uh, participate actively and also to come back for the remaining five the training sessions in this series. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Mwale. You have clearly set us out the context within which we are working and also helped us recognize the wide range of partnerships that we have with us as we go forward together uh, using Foresight. So thank you so much for that. And um, at, at this moment, I'd like to share my screen and give a little bit of background um, on our webinar series. So today is our first webinar uh, we're going to be introducing foresight for agriculture and climate change planning. And please allow me allow me to introduce the training team. Um, our lead trainers are um, Sabrina Chesterman. Please wave, Sabrina. <laughs> Uh, along with myself. Uh, this is all the CCAFS team. We have climate and foresight specialists, Dr. Leslie Lipper, Dr. Philip Thornton. Uh, regional policy expert is Romy Chevalier. Romy, yes. And uh, climate scientist, Claire Quinn. We also have a number of colleagues working on communications and research. Lily Selaji, Amanda Gosling, Deborah Hart, Bridget Kakua, Pierre Andrea Perani, who you've already met. And our oversight uh, is Hannah Savas, who is uh, the lead for GIZ ACRA program, Dr. Baitsi Podisi from Cardesa, and Dr. Philip Thornton, who is a flagship leader for the CCAFs on climate change. So this is the first of six webinars. So they're going to take place at, um, at this hour for six consecutive weeks. And we will be covering all of the dimensions of uh, foresight. And we'll go into much more detail about how those different webinars um, unfold. So along with the training, the webinar series, there is going to be a foresight toolkit, which everyone will have available um, at the end of the at the end of the six part series. So you'll have a toolkit that will be online and um, downloadable. There's a foresight training website. So in July, we'll be finalizing a Cardessa website for the Foresight Training Resource Center. And there is going to be a certificate of participation that will be presented by Cardessa and CCAFs um, that will be awarded in webinar six for those that have been able to join us for the full six sessions. And following uh, the webinar series, there is going to be an e-learning course that can be accessed at the Cardessa website with lots of materials. And, um, and there will be, for that, a certificate of completion. So let me just tell you quickly about our training approach. So throughout our six weeks together, we will take the opportunity to introduce the foresight method and approach, which means that we're going to unpack key steps that one takes um, related to different methods and tools that we'll be using we're going to um, spend quite a bit of energy on how to apply these steps of the methods and tools. And at times we'll take the opportunity to take a deeper understanding, a dive into the content. And of course, we're applying this um, method in SADC in the member states uh, around the theme of agriculture systems and climate resilience. So Pierre has already shared with you some of the details around how to, um, to engage using Zoom, but I just want to remind a couple, of, a couple of points. So we call these principles of engagement. So everyone is muted if they're not speaking. Um, we're asking people to put their questions in the chat. All questions are considered important. And, um, and we always ask that um, our chat interventions are respectful of all of the participants. Please be comfortable 
during this session, have water, have refreshments, be comfortable, be in learning mode. And uh, we will have some two minute stretch breaks throughout uh, the program. And again, I know a lot of people tend to take snapshots of the screen and you're of course welcome to do that, but you will be receiving a slide summary following the webinar and take notes as you feel they're useful. So on to webinar one. Um, so the flow of today is uh, we're going to get a foresight training overview, introducing the foresight. We're going to do one small participatory exercise and, um, and we'll have several opportunities to have questions and answers. So today we'll be introducing the scope method around theme, around boundaries, policies and structures, and timelines and stakeholder mapping. And at the end, we'll have a roundup of more questions and answers and see where we are. So now we'd like to invite you to a poll that has, I believe, six questions. And um, we're just gonna go through these uh, rather swiftly. We're probably not gonna spend time discussing the responses. But what we'd love to ascertain is how we experience the future. So I see the first question is up and you choose all that apply. It's actually one question, sorry, Pierre here, just a quick comment. The question are one after the other, so you can scroll down, you will see all the, six, the, the question in this poll. So it's a poll uh, with um, multiple questions, six questions, so you've got a scroll bar and you can go through question one, the future is, and then move on to question two, how comfortable are you thinking about the future and then scrolling down. Thank you so much, Pierre. Please cast your vote. And I hope everybody is okay with the sound. We're still trying to help uh, Dr. Simon Muale is still uh, having some, some issue. I hope everybody else um, is okay. Um, and I welcome, I, I encourage all attendees to um, take part in this poll, which um, uh, will give us and the facilitation team a lot of useful information for this session and to um, design the next webinars in this series. I see the votes are starting to come in quite slowly, but we've got, we're now about 25%. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll keep it running for a bit. Um, I see that some of you are also using the um, raise end option. Um, again, we'll, um, we'll make use of that later on, uh, but it's good that you know already where to find it. Please keep casting your vote. And as I said, you can scroll down at the bottom. Um, to, in order to submit, uh, you have to fill in all the questions. You'll be able to submit uh, the poll when uh, uh, you have replied to all of them. I see some comments in the chat about it. There is a scroll bar at the right hand side of the poll and you should be able to scroll to view all the questions in this poll. I see some of you are having some issues, but I see that um, others are, for others it's working, for the majority is working okay. We've got 61% of votes now. I mean, 61% of the attendees is 70 now. So it goes fast, it moves up fast. Um, <clears throat> So Yemi, I see your comment. You should see the, sc the scroll bar on the right hand side of the poll window. And as I said, you can submit when you're finished replying to all of them. 
We give it a few more seconds. Let's try to get to 80%. Yeah, that's very true, Douglas. I see your comment. Yes, um, it's very true. The interface is different if you are on a laptop or uh, on a tablet or on a device, uh, on a mobile device. Thanks for uh, uh, reminding me of that. Um, I, I'm using a laptop myself and um, uh, I was so much into this interface that I forgot to mention that the interface might be different um, if you're using a different device. But I think that for the majority is working fine. We got 87% of votes. So we'll uh, last chance to submit and we'll be closing in three, two, one. So I'm now ending the poll um, and I'm sharing the results. So you should be able now to share, to see the results, same principle. Um, it's multiple questions. So you should be able to move through, scroll through the questions. Constance, over to you. Yes, thank you so much. So um, I like that the poll results highlight the, the ones with the most votes. So the future is uncertain and unpredictable. In some cases, foreseeable, navigable, uh, controllable, and certain. But no one feels that it is fixed. So we uh, refer back to Dr. Moale's comments about being able to participate and shape. Um, how comfortable are we in thinking about the future? Actually comfortable, and in some cases, a little uncomfortable. And some of us are very uncomfortable, but many very, very comfortable. When we think about um, the future, um, we think that predominantly we're comfortable on certain topics, but not on others. Uh, it can still be limited um, because it's a bit abstract. And there are some that are very competent to vision the future. When you're planning for your personal future, the majority uh, of us are thinking 2030. And when we're thinking of our work future, we're often working in the time frame of about five years. So how would we like to use the tools and processes? Um, these are some of the processes we've already used uh, for planning the future. And predominantly, we're around uh, strategic planning, but we also build off of personal experiences and scenarios and personal intuition for the large part. So with that, uh, thank you so much for taking the poll. And um, I am going to now invite uh, Sabrina Chesterman, who is going to share her screen and give us an introduction to Foresight. Great, thank you so much. Um, thanks so much to uh, Constance. Uh, sorry. There we go. Perfect. Um, thank you very much, Constance. Um, and good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Um, I know we have some diverse timelines here. I'm just going to try and take you through an introduction to Foresight. Um, we've, we've heard from some of the introductions that there's quite a new topic for some people, but I've just seen 40% um, have replied that they've used scenarios. So. You might not have known it, but you have already used some tools and methods in Foresight. So that's great. So if we were to define what Foresight is, um, it can really be thought of as a set of tools and methods to practically help us move toward the future we want. So it's not a prediction of the future, but we can think of Foresight essentially of helping us manage different possible futures. And we really go into Foresight thinking that the future can actively be um, influenced or even created. And I think um, Dr. Marley said it brilliantly there in terms of we want to be active participants in shaping the future. So with a foresight, we really think around um, essentially four key pillars. We try to understand what seems to be happening. We then really unpack what's really happening and then try to look and say, okay, what might happen? And then what do we need to do? 
So under each of these um, key guiding questions in a foresight process, all of them have different sets of tools and methods which we're going to learn. But it's really these questions that guide you through understanding and trying to, to navigate a foresight process to really ultimately go from trying to understand what's happening to really putting together a strategy of, okay, now we have a better sense of the future. What do we need to do? And I think uh, it's really important as we set off on this training to uh, reiterate to all of, all of the participants that there's no standardized way of doing foresight. So foresight's a, a set of um, tools and methods as mentioned. This has come um, from many disciplines. It's used often in the private sector or corporates. And it's been increasingly used now in, in applications for planning with governments, with development, um, and, and really applying to some of the critical questions um, in our region. So what the methods you use or you choose, um, the, 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 the level you go into a foresight process really depends on the questions um, and the context you will apply it. So just so you know, you are really agents of how you apply the foresight method. So for this training, um, with that in mind, we've put together essentially a, a set of key steps and stages, which we're going to run you through um, over the six part um, series of the webinars. So we start from input, we then look at analysis, interpretation, plan, prospection, reflection, and strategy. And I promise by webinar six, you will all be experts and be able to say this in your sleep. Um, so just to, to brief a little bit, what are some of the questions we're trying to answer in each of these phases? So with an input, we're really trying to understand what is the context? What, what, is, happening in, what is happening right now? And then we move on to analysis um, and really sort of deepen that question a little bit more. And then interpretation is a really important stage because we say, why is it happening? And I think um, we saw from the poll, a lot of people use strategic planning. Um, often in strategic planning, we, we maybe don't have these pause moments to understand why something is happening. Once we have done a bit of interpretation, we then move on to planning. We say what we want to experience in the future, and what might get in our way and um, what might we do to get there. So really taking a deep dive into a plan. And prospection is a really interesting phase in foresight and I think one of the most critical ones. Um, and I think this is a good point to mention also that foresight being a set of tools and methods, one of the most important things is actually a change in thinking. It's a confidence to be able to think and view um, different states around the future. So to be able to change some of your planning or your implementation processes. So prospection really focuses on what might happen that we have not thought about. <laughs> and I think, um, yeah, uh, Dr. Morley really set us up well to layer in what we've been seeing from an agricultural perspective, climate risks, and now COVID-19. And I think if we were all sitting here last year and we've been asked to say, what would 2020 look like? I don't. I don't know if many people would be able to say how COVID-19 would emerge. So prospection really tries to open up our mind to say what are the possible futures. And then obviously from opening up our mind and looking at these possible futures, we need to reflect. We say, okay, what might we need to do differently? And then we build a strategy to we say, okay, how do we enact that? How do we make those changes in our policies, our strategies, our projects, etc.? cetera? So, um, just to put those a little bit more, I think it's great that the first poll we heard some answers and I think, sorry, some of you may not have done that poll, we did it as we were coming in, but we were asking people what they wanted to get from the training and I think a lot of people were talking about applying tools and methods. So I wanna just run you through a set um, of some of the methods and tools that we are going to dive into across the training and how it will work. Don't worry, you don't have to take this all in now. We will constantly um, be sort of running through this and, and making it clear. So today we're in the input phase. We really um, are teaching about how to understand context and going through the scope method. So I won't go through that in detail. Um, next week we move on to the analysis where we really unpack what is happening in terms of using trends analysis and horizon scanning and how to integrate evidence. Um, and we'll also be doing a deep dive in terms of key mega trends in the SADC region related to agriculture and climate. And then interpretation, also happening next week is why is it happening? Systems mapping 
as a key tool, and then also cross uh, explaining how to do cross sectoral and multi stakeholder approaches. And then planning. What do we want to experience and what might get in our way? So we then dig into tools such as visioning, how to do causal analysis, how to build on a stakeholder analysis, backcasting, and pathway development, recognizing that there's different trade-offs in future um, development. Respection. So here, I think 41% have said they've already done scenarios. So we'll be really excited for some active participation in this webinar. Um, where we will be uh, taking a deep dive into how to develop scenarios, uh, specifically identifying drivers and critical uncertainties, and then how to develop plausible future scenarios. And then reflection, we will be teaching about how to then actually unpack when you've done a, a futures exercise like scenarios, how do you unpack the implications? How do you then understand if your system or where you've been planning around needs to maybe undergo transformational change? And I think we've heard transformation is quite a buzzword at the moment, and we'll try and unpack some of those elements and what might need to be changed. And then strategy, what will we do differently? And this is helping to then put together some of the pathways we started on in our plan stage, and then building out climate resilient pathways. So we will also be grounding all of this. I think Constance mentioned in the beginning about our training approach. We've tried to make it very practical and applied. So throughout the training, we are going to be using examples. We're going to be taking a deep dive into content at times in terms of explaining climate risk in the region, historical climate and agricultural events. We'll be learning about building climate resilient pathways relevant to agriculture, et cetera. So I won't go through those in detail, but just so you are aware, we're going to be really grounding it in the topic and the region. And um, how this plays out, um, as mentioned, we're in the first webinar, and then these um, stages and steps play out through the five webinars. And our sixth webinar is then to build action plans with you as trainees to say, how do you want to use and apply these tools going out of the training? So it's a very tailored session to go over each of them, and we'll be working in groups to then make um, different action plans leaving the training. So um, I think <coughs> Dr. Mali gave a very good overview of this. So um, I won't, don't, don't want to take too much time, but why, why foresight particularly what we're focusing on, building climate resilience? So I just grabbed some water, sorry guys. In terms of um, agricultural production, um, we have to increase this by approximately 50% by 2050 to meet some population and um, food security needs. We also know across the region, there's diminishing land availability. We have big issues with soil and biodiversity degradation and increasingly erratic events. I think um, Dr. Molly again, teed us up with some of, some of the recent things across the last few seasons. And obviously agricultural practices, one of the key issues in the region is unpredictable supply of water. And when we know we need to increase our um, agricultural production to meet a growing population, and we don't have sufficient irrigation or technology in place right now, we are starting to see um, some futures emerging that are a little bit unpredictable and um, quite, um, quite scary in some places. So how can we try and use foresight as a tool and a set of methods to try and work towards some of these big trends that are happening? And really what, what we're hoping um, this training does and by understanding some of these big tool, these tools and methods, we can actually apply it to some of these big questions where we're saying, how do we move towards a climate resilient future? So big questions such as what does sustainable and equitable economic growth look like for SADC? What, will, what role will agriculture and natural resources play? And what impacts will climate change have? And importantly, how do these play out? So, to round up a little bit, and we will keep going over this, um, and I want to keep encouraging you to register your questions in the chat box. We will make sure to keep um, in the Q&As going back to these. But I just wanted to run over some key terms as we started the start the introduction to this training. And um, I think by the end of it, everyone will be quite expert at describing um, these. So foresight itself, I think we've just, just defined in terms of structured tools, methods, and thinking styles. 
to enable the capacity to consider multiple futures and plan for them. Forecasting, um, and these terms often get confused somewhat, um, where people think they're doing forecasting and they might be doing foresight and vice versa. Forecasting is essentially an estimate or best case of what might happen in the future, where we use data and evidence, but it's not essentially a definitive prediction. So I think if you're like me, you log on and you look at the, the weather forecast, that is the forecasters putting together their best estimate of what might happen in the next three days, but it doesn't always play out as we know. So futuring, what is that? It's the act, art or science of identifying and evaluating possible future events. So you have people who are, have a job title as a futurist. That means that they've gotten and honed their skills to be able to really identify and dig and look at data and trends and, and systems and say, okay, what might be possible future events? And actually, I think futurists have really been called upon in the last um, two to three months to say, did we perceive this pandemic? Do we see more coming, et cetera? So, that's the art of the futuring. And then within this process, we often are really trying to unpack drivers. These are the factors that cause change. They affect and they shape the future. And often these drivers are very uncertain. And I think um, because many of you have done scenarios exercises, you will know that scenarios exercises really put together these, these drivers that um, are basically the most uncertain and the ones that we think might have the highest impact. And a trend is essentially a general tendency or direction of a movement. So when we say we're doing a trend analysis, we're trying to see what is the general tendency or direction. So we know across our region, we've been having increasingly erratic seasonal rainfall patterns. That's a trend. And then we can scale up what we call a mega trend when we know that that's happening at a large or global scale. So across the continent, we know that there's a growing youth population. So we can scale that up and say, we know that that's actually a mega trend happening. And I've just mentioned this, but just to quickly um, wrap up around scenario development, it's, um, it's an approach within Foresight um, to understand these high impact and high uncertain drivers. So now if you were asked, have you used Foresight? You can actually say, yes, I think I have used one of the tools or methods already. Um, and um, importantly, and we'll dive very deeply into scenarios in the fourth webinar, but really um, they're, they're not ever correct. Um, they're not ever sort of true. The scenarios really aim to be plausible. So they allow us to envision lots of different um, future states. So I won't go into this in much detail, but um, as, as, as you've all mentioned in the polls, um, we're not coming into foresight in Africa new. This has been um, this has been practiced over, I think, more significantly over the last 10 years in detail. Um, and there's been a number of studies, a number of projects, a number of consortiums that have really started to push this. And I think within um, actually 2020, we've really seen a boom in this is, this is a topic we need to predict the future. Um, so I'll just quickly give a summary, for example, um, an exercise that was done um, in 2018 across four countries in the SADC region, um, just taking um, examples from Zambia and Tanzania. This was the Africa project. Um, so I think we do have a number of colleagues from Zambia and Tanzania maybe would have been engaged in some of these um, workshops. Again, these um, exercises look to really unpack drivers, um, look at uncertainty, and then really try and unpack what would be a desired future. So, um, we have unpacked and we, will, we have a kind of an accompanying resource um, which will be distributed, which is a kind of deep um, study in terms of work to date in, in the region on scenarios. And with that, I will hand over to Factor Constance, who's going to run a participatory exercise um, to basically try and unpack some of those four key questions and pillars of uh, foresight. Francis, I'll um, okay. just keep the screen. That's ideal. Thank you so much, Sabrina. So as uh, Sabrina has teed us up and she's talked to us about the four um, key questions that we'll be asking. So let's um, quickly look at those uh, at a personal level. And um, 
We're going to be um, putting a lot of messages into the chat box, so be ready. So let me tee this up. We are all living through the effects of COVID-19, and it's having a very big impact on how we are seeing the present as well as the future. So what we'd like to have you do right now is to think back um, before the pandemic. Think back to what you were expecting that you would be doing during the year 2020 before the COVID pandemic started. And so in the chat box, please share with us some of the plans that you had for this year, be they a workshop, a family wedding, some field work. What kind of um, activities did you expect to be doing for 2020? And we hope to see the chat box light up with some responses. Aha, uh -huh. there was a lot of travel that was planned. Exactly. And someone was hoping for a family wedding in Europe as well as, be as field work. Field work, a holiday with the family. A lot of workshops. Ooh, a CFA exam. And participation in conferences. Oh, a lot of field work was planned. Uh, Namibia, Zimbabwe. Oh, a renewable energy conference. And, um, oh, that's brilliant. Ah, the Two Oceans Marathon. Look at that. Yes, face-to-face -face workshops. Oh my goodness, so many plans. Ooh, someone was headed for India for work. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So those are the kind of things that we anticipated were going to be happening. So now we're gonna to go to the next question about what is really happening? So if you would type into the chat box, how different is your situation now? What's changed with the pandemic? Now it's just home office. Oh, lockdowns. Oh my goodness. <laughs> So social distancing restrictions, very much challenged to think differently. Lots of desk-based studies, since we're not out doing our field work. <laughs> Baking, yes, more time, food for the family. All right, everything has been pushed. Vegetable gardening. All right, so a lot has changed. Shall we... Um, move down, oh, many things were canceled. So we move on to question three. So now I want you to think about your plans for 2021 and describe what you think your work environment will look like or your personal activities. What do you think might happen in 2021? What will be different? All right, intending to be back in the field, back at the office, not traveling as much. Ooh, not sure. Catching up on all that field work that got postponed. Being involved in more virtual meetings and, oh, completing an online MSC. Fantastic. All right. And so now, I want you to go back to 2019 and think about when you were planning 2020, if you had the knowledge that COVID-19 was coming in 2020, what would you have changed in how you planned 
2020. I would have done my field work in December and January. Should have saved more money for this time. Bought a cheap ticket in advance. Yes. Just keep flexible and better preparation for our virtual capacities. Oh, these all resonate so much. More robust planning. Prepared for that and spent more time with my family. And a lot of people felt we could have saved some money. So for, it, for this likelihood. Well, thank you so much for those responses. Um, so Sabrina has, um, has helped us lay the groundwork for a very condensed foresight process. And thank you for engaging. And may I turn it back to Sabrina. Um, sure, thanks very much, Constance. Um, so we're just going to open up for a Q&A now. Um, that was a, a, a very rapid introduction to Foresight, but I think you've seen across the the six webinars, we have, a, we have a real chance to dive deep into the tools and the methods and the approach. But in our introduction here, I think um, it's a really nice point to take a bit of a pause and to hear a couple of questions. So, um, Pierre, do you have any questions you can sort of give to the panel? And we'll um, take a couple of questions now. Thanks, Sabrina. Yes, we got a couple of questions, a few questions that came in as you were presenting. Um, and of course, we welcome participants to still submit additional ones uh, as, uh, um, as we go on. So I think the first question um, that comes from Oliver, uh, and first one of the slides that you presented, the question is, uh, uh, says, the key terms uh, the key terms of slide makes me think of projection versus forecasting. How different is foresight from projecting? Um, sh sh do, do you want, uh, maybe we do one by one. Eh? We've got, uh, we've got uh, two, three questions. So maybe we go do this first one and then we take another one. Sure, sure. I think, and, and, and um, I think that was from Oliver, right? Yes. Uh, thank you, great question. Um, and in fact, uh, there is, I mean, the key terms or terminology slides could be, um, could be quite endless actually in foresight. There's a, lot, um, there's a lot of terminology between if we project something, does that mean that it's true? Um, versus if we forecast something and we use data and evidence, but if we bring in evidence to do a projection, is that any different? So um, in terms of like how, how we are teaching and we'll be training this, we, for example, in a scenarios process, you can project into the future, and that can be based on some of those tools we saw in the, in the opening. So your intuition, some data, some evidence, some planning. So that's a projection of what might happen, but it's not necessarily true. It just might be plausible. So we hope that we, when we do a projection, it's not kind of completely out of the realms of possibility, but it's a projection of what might happen. So I hope that helps versus forecasting is essentially often associated with more of like a data and an evidence process to it. So it's a little bit more um, constrained in the, in, in the plausibility that we look at. Um, so if we thought of um, a projection of a pandemic um, happening, would we, if we'd done forecasting, we might have used models that had already looked at a pandemic spread in just a country. Versus if we project it, can we really think about how a pandemic can spread globally? That would allow us to maybe look at it in that scale. So Thanks, I hope, and I, that's a great point. And we'll make sure um, in a lot of when we're taking the Q&A that in the resources and the responses that we make sure that as we upload to the website after each webinar, that um, we make um, some of those, those findings clearer. Yeah, I hope that uh, I hope that Oliver is happy with the uh, answer you provided, and of course, Oliver, you're welcome to comment on Sabrina's response in the chat. Um, the other, another question comes from uh, Sandil, uh, and the question goes: How do we manage the overlaps in the different planning methodologies related to foresight? Sure. 
great question. <laughs> very, very difficult question as well. Because even actually planning out how to, to, to train on Foresight, we, we had a lot of wrangling between the team behind us about how do you separate some methods and how do you put them into bundles of, of that process and those stages. So I would um, probably just encourage that firstly, you don't want to be too locked in. So for example, um, we, we had at the top of the framework, data, evidence and knowledge runs across all of these stages. So it's not like in our analysis phase, we collect all our data and then we're done. You, you're going to constantly be building futures tools and we'll be using a scenario, for example, or causal analysis. And then we'll say, I actually don't know enough about this topic. I need to collect some more data and some more evidence. So how do you choose what's best to do? I think in, in a practical sense, and this is really what we hope in webinar six, we can really help create these tailored action plans because these exercises obviously do take time. There's some expense related to them and then there's who's involved. So it's really a priority of saying within my scope of my question that I want to answer, which, um, which kind of part of the tools and even we've tried to break the tools into steps. So you might even just say, when I look at the scope, I actually just need to outline the stakeholders. I don't really need to, to talk about the geographic boundary, et cetera. So I think um, the key Sanil, is to be flexible um, and you can take and, and, and cherry pick some of these tools and methods. And in fact, what you've seen, what we will be teaching, this is also just a selection. There are many other tools and methods that can be applied in Foresight. Thanks, Sabrina. I think we have time to take uh, one more. Uh, um, and actually, one that just came in from Olaf. Uh, you can read uh, in the chat, it's a recent question. All the other were uh, before the, the exercise. Um, you, can re oh, you can all read it, but let me read it out as well. Can you work uh, with your foresight tools at all levels, from governments and multi-stakeholders platforms to farming communities? Yes. Yeah. Great, and um, Olaf, I think we have met before, so if I'm right, um, hello again, nice to see you in a different circumstance. Um, yeah, I think um, absolutely, and I think if I'm right, Olaf um, works in, in both a strategic role, but um, the organization he's working with is very implementation on the ground. So I think that's a great question, and we will be essentially, when we're learning the tools and methods in, the, in this series, we will be sort of tailored more at a, a essentially maybe a technical or a planning level within a ministry or a government or a project level. But absolutely, the whole, the whole spectrum of how that technique can be used, we very much, so for example, we'll be learning a quick snapshot later about stakeholder mapping. That can be done at a community level, absolutely, saying what is the influence of different stakeholders and how they interact. And whether you do that at a regional uh, in a political sphere, or you take that down to a farmer's community level. Um, we, we, we hope and we will be encouraging that these tools are very applicable across these different scales, because if we all plan and sit in a room as, as strategists, um, it's not really getting to um, the, the application phase. So I think a great question and um, a good point for us, we will make sure to try um, when we're describing the tools and methods, how, how these could be potentially scaled back or expanded at different levels. Thank you, Sabrina. Do you want to take one more before we take our, our first break? Um, sure. Just uh, maybe, a, maybe a quick one. So there is this one, uh, uh, again, in the chat from uh, uh, Temitope. Is there an overlap in the methods and processes used for foresight and projections? And maybe just a quick reply on this one, and then we take a break so we can move on, on to the next segment of, on, of the webinar. Sure, yeah, I, I think I'll just reply to that because it's a bit similar to the one earlier in terms of um, projection. Again, it's like um, climate smart agriculture has been defined and we have now a set of practices that are climate smart. Uh, um, you know, foresight is, a, is a, a set of tools and methods and we can do projection within that or you can say I do projections independently. Um, so that there is an overlap, but projection as a, a, as a tool um, or, or kind of, I would even encourage to say that's a thinking style, um, falls within the foresight umbrella as well. But we can um, make sure that we, we get some kind of clear definitions of, of um, projection and foresight, because that's obviously coming up as an interesting point. Yeah. Great. Um, 
Great. So I think if there's no more questions, we are, we are sort of halfway through our, our training. We're actually running a little bit over, but we thought um, we'll just take this opportunity to do a one minute stretch. I'm, I'm standing here, so I'm able to kind of stretch out quite easily. But um, we want to make sure we keep you healthy and energized through this series. If everyone wants to get any water, um, quick bathroom break or anything, we'll just take a, a one minute recess now in the training. And um, also use this opportunity to register in any more questions and we'll make sure we get back to those at the end of the session. So just a minute to stretch, check your phone if you need to, to um, anything you need to do for a minute and then we'll dive into our first uh, method. I also take this opportunity to do some housekeeping before we go into the next uh, into the next segment. Um, we already mentioned about uh, uh, sharing the materials, the recordings of the webinar. I'm not sure we will be sharing the email addresses of all participants. You know, there are privacy issues and all that. Uh, I see some people asking for for uh, email addresses. So I think we have to make uh, um, a decision. I'm not sure we're allowed to share all participant lists, the participant list in terms of emails. We can share names uh, um, and you can probably look up each other on uh, LinkedIn uh, if you are on LinkedIn. Uh, but I probably, uh, we, we probably won't be sharing email addresses. I see some of you are sharing email addresses in the chat. Um, that's, that's all right, it's up to you. Um, but remember that this webinar is being recorded and uh, we'll, uh, um, we'll make use of the materials later on. So just that you know um, where this information is, is gonna go. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So and I, wish, I wish we were all in the room together <laughs> so I could see if everyone is stretched and everyone's happy, no one's sneezing off. But um, unfortunately in this virtual world, all I can see is myself and my screen. So um, I hope that was a little break um, and you're ready for the next part. And I think I just want to also encourage you, um, we, really, we really are hoping in the way we've built this training series across the six webinars, so we really hope we get a core cool set of um, colleagues that will be able to join us through the six um, and we will be making them as, as interactive and adaptable um, and they're really tailored to what participants want to learn and how they want to learn. So there is, although we are doing these formal webinars, we would love it to be as um, some informality in terms of this is a training and we really are here to try and maximize what you can learn out of it. So as much as we can virtually, we will continue to try and make it um, as participatory as possible and keep adapting along the way. So, We've had our um, introduction into Foresight and I think um, I didn't dwell too much on each of the processes, but um, we are now essentially what um, in the first part of the, the framework, which we will be keep referring to in the training series, um, what we call the input phase, where we really try to understand our context. Um, so we're gonna run you through um, some of the steps we've broken down. To, to run through this and um, uh, I'll start off and then I will hand over to Romy to take the second part. And please remember to register your questions, yes. So just referring back to this framework, this is where we are in terms of scope. Um, we'll be going in terms of defining the theme and the topic. We then try to outline the geographic boundary and the structures and the policies and a timeline and a stakeholder map. So again, just reiterating, when you decide or take on a foresight exercise, depending what context this is, depending whether it's even within your department, within a small project, a big project, um, whichever context you're in, um, we have quite a few re researchers in an academia. And if you're thinking about even how maybe your research or topical areas might fit into some of this, uh, we just wanna remind you that um, these are some suggested steps and actions, but it really depends on what's most applicable to your question, what you do. So in terms of just expanding scope, um, it's essentially one of the most important steps in conducting a foresight exercise because we define the purpose of our exercise, 
um, we get really clear on actually what, what is the sort of envisioning future that we want to go through. Um, and it really gives us the boundaries to say where we're, where we're working within. Um, and I want to say boundaries um, quite um, cautiously because we, we, we give you a set of things that could allow you to set this boundary. But remembering in, in foresight planning and as we go through different tools and methods, that boundary constantly changes as we are, as we are learning more. So um, as you've seen, this happens um, in the first part of the framework. And we would suggest, when do you apply the scope? Um, this, is, this is really at the beginning um, and starting off a foresight process. So this is the most ap applicable way you would use this tool. So um, the key steps which um, we've put together as um, a, a sort of practical way to move through scope is really setting the, key, the theme or key topic, setting the geo uh, geopolitical boundary, and then understanding what are potentially the relevant structures institutions and policies that govern that, that, that relative geopolitical area and the theme and topic you've selected. And also once you've looked at these policies and structures, does that give you a timeline to set your foresight exercise? I think at the beginning we asked you a few questions about how you envision futures and I think it came up quite common in work. People think five years ahead and it'd be interesting um, to unpack and maybe in the chat box did you choose five years because that's governed by a, a national structure of planning or is that is that a normal project cycle and um, why why five years that would be really interesting to know what why you have that scope already um, and then we'll teach a little bit about how do you integrate and map stakeholders um, so just to take an example and i think uh, referring back to what constance was mentioning at the beginning with the training approach we will teach you a topic um, in terms of a method and tool that's used in foresight and then we will try and apply it and we will try and give you very contextual examples um, of climate resilience agricultural development and focusing on the SADC region so we will be dipping between method and tool and then application to try and show you how you can um, use and apply the tool and method so <laughs> in our theme um, we have probably one of the more <laughs> complex themes that we could have chosen in terms of agri-food systems and climate resilience. And I think um, there seemed to be also in the opening poll quite a big interest in a topical area of climate resilience and also kind of agricultural planning. So we hope that some of these contextual um, examples are useful from, from the applied sense. So the first part of theme is you've got to break it down into parts. Um, as I mentioned, we have quite a complex theme. You might have a very simple contained, like I know exactly I want to do a foresight exercise on this theme and it might be not as complex um, or this might be you know, a five minute exercise for you. Or if you are dealing with a more complex topic, this is why um, theme itself is a step because you really start your kind of foresight and thinking process by opening up to what is happening in that wider theme. So if we say our theme is agri-food systems as part one, well, what are we taking into consideration? So we say, okay, at the heart of it, we know is agriculture. And then, okay, what is happening within agriculture? Are there various things that happen within an agricultural system? Um, and we know agriculture is not just crops, it's livestock, it's fisheries, it's, and it's linked to forestry as well. And then you can unpack your kind of core theme and then bring in other aspects such as extension, access to inputs, etc. So you would start to, to create this brainstorm canvas with your theme. And then more widely within your actual core theme of agriculture, how does it relate to other themes and kind of categories? So here we've got economic aspects, technology aspects, environment, the underlying natural resource base, uh, potentially future developments of energy, etc. The political um, state, how does that relate to agriculture? And then you've got sociocultural dimensions, so population, labor availab availability, etc. So you can see when you start to unpack your theme, it can be a very complex process to start saying, okay, when we're thinking of the future, and I think of agricultural development, it's not one dimension, it's many things 
that are going to overlay. And um, in um, next week's webinar, we're going to take you into a detailed method of how to do systems mapping. So how you can create a systems map and then how you can use that for planning. So this would be sort of the end result of uh, potentially like a systems map where you're able to really unpack categories um, and, and really dimensions within those categories. Um, and you can see it gets very complex and then you would have to say, okay, what do we need to dive into? What data do we need to get? What evidence, et cetera? <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, we've had our stretch. <laughs> Um, so the second part of our theme is climate resilience. Um, and uh, climate resilience could have its own um, webinar to try and unpack, but we've tried to just give a very brief introduction here because over the six part series, we, we will be applying the tools and methods in very different ways to unpack climate resilience and, and dimensions. So to start off, to think about climate resilience, it's important to remember that climate change um, has an impact on our agri-food system and how, how climate resilient our agricultural system is. So you have production activities. Um, we know that climate change impacts on all of those in terms of like marine productivity, uh, overall water availability, erosion, food safety, etc. So we know that, okay, there's impacts from climate change on our system. And we know that there's also impacts in terms of post-production activities. So storage, transportation, harvesting, retail, et cetera. And then there's also broader impacts on the food systems and, and um, food security itself. And then obviously within defining your theme um, in climate resilience, as we're setting it up, you then can also reflect and say, but is, is climate change also then actually, is the agri-food system impacting on climate change? Is there a vice versa impact? And we know that um, production activities from application of fertilizer, animal feed, um, through to post-production, things such as transportation, refrigeration, et cetera, those are all um, contributing to emissions from the agricultural sector. So you start to say, are there two-way relationships in our theme as well? So what are we taking into account when we consider climate resilience? In its simplest form, the, the best kind of um, simple explanation of climate resilience is essentially the ability of a system to bounce back from the impacts of climate related stresses or shocks. And we say the word system here because you could say a, um, a village, a, a district, a region, a country, um, you know, there's different ways you could also kind of scale out what's related to your theme. And often climate resilience is defined as a set of capacities. So if we were trying to unpack climate resilience and those capacities to an agricultural system, we have uh, tried to group these into kind of five key themes to make it a little bit easier. So if we think about, we try to build capacities in terms of infrastructure, those are adaptive structures, able to kind of withstand different shocks or to be resilient to shocks and stresses. We have the capacity of people to adapt. We have ecosystems. So our ecosystem services providing robust um, um, kind of resilience in our system. And then you also have kind of livelihood systems themselves. What's the capacity of our livelihood systems to respond, et cetera. So these are, if we were to try and break down climate resilience, you can think of it as these capacities and these different categories. And just to give a quick set of what you would think of as potentially examples under each of those categories. So if we think about people and innovation, um, I think Dr. Marley gave a great example. We know um, in East Africa, there's been uh, really troublesome locust swarms and that it's causing a huge impact on production um, and food security, but it's also creating innovation. We know people are harvesting locusts to now do as chicken feed. So that's innovation in the face of a shock, and that's the, the capacity of people to adapt. Um, we know in terms of infrastructure, there's aspects such as you could be bolstering your water storage capacity, et cetera, um, how you can also prepare from a, from a cyclone perspective, et cetera. I think everyone knows that Byra was completely almost wiped out, they didn't have any kind of cyclone preparedness um, in place. 
So can you prepare your infrastructure for some of these shocks and stresses? And then we think about governments. This goes from national to regional um, and thinking about the capacity potentially of local institutions. And then we have ecosystems. So in terms of a practice of sustainable management, climate smart agriculture, agroecology, et cetera. And then we can think of our livelihood systems. So this is a very brief overview <laughs> of climate resilience. And just to take us back to the tool and method, we are saying in our scope, what is our theme? So before we dive into a foresight and we're in this first process, we really need to unpack. You've seen when we say agri-food systems, there are multiple dimensions. When there's climate resilience, there's multiple things we need to take into account. And then we basically build off this scope as we go along the processes. So I will now hand over to my esteemed colleague, Romy, who will take us through the next step in terms of our scope phase. You just unmute, Remy. Here we go. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon, and thank you for staying online. Uh, fantastic to e meet you all. I'm sorry, under these strange circumstances, that we can't do this um, uh, on a face to face basis, but it's wonderful to see everybody. And thanks, Sabrina. Um, so, I, I guess just following on directly from what Sabrina was saying, um, What's really important is that it's what's critical is to understand the widest net of our theme. So in order to do this, um, we need to first set a geographical boundary. Um, and what we have to do is understand the scale that we're considering. So Sabrina mentioned that can, this can be um, any different uh, scale, uh, everywhere from the smallest uh, project zone all the way through to the regional scale. Um, and yeah, obviously we have to understand the, the dynamics of the scale. The second thing to do, we need to understand what is contained within the select boundary. So there's obviously numerous dynamics um, that we have to understand within our selected boundary, um, geopolitical dynamics, social cultural dynamics, any environmental factors, um, and obviously economic, any, any economic factors um, that we will obviously need to interrogate. So let's just, let's just ground this. So what I'm here to speak about is obviously static and understanding um, some of the context and dynamic of static um, as our selected geographical boundary. So SADC is a region um, that consists of 16 member countries. Um, obviously, all of, most of you here today are participating from member countries and at various levels. And SADC is a regional economic community that was founded um, three decades ago, I think, back in 1992, um, by the signing of a treaty. And essentially what it did is it's grouped, it grouped countries um, to essentially facilitate um, economic development through regional, regional integration and through uh, common markets facilitate trade and movement of people. By virtue of the fact that, uh, that we're looking at regional integration, this means that we ob obviously the region shares common systems and natural resources like shared water systems, transboundary front frontier parks, other ecosystems, forests, infrastructure, and the like. So if we look at uh, SADC as an actual entity, as a unit, um, we obviously consider all the member countries together um, and uh, we can consider this as obviously the population side of, uh, size of SADC. We look at uh, rural population dynamics, youth population dynamics, and all of this is really, this is all obviously very um, important in understanding the context of the region. What is very important, I think, here is that um, when considering the region, it's also important to note that each of the member countries obviously have their own personal characteristics. So when um, in a foresight exercise, um, when we're envisaging possible futures, we need to appreciate national circumstances and local differences and, and uh, priorities um, for each individual country. What's also interesting here is you'll just notice um, from, the, from the variety of countries that we hear, you can almost group them into three subgroups. So we have six coastal countries, uh, four island countries in SADC, as well as six landlocked countries, which in and of itself represents particular dynamics. Here we go, what I've tried to illustrate here is um, just that we've selected two of the 16 member countries. And I just wanted to show you the, the, the variety of um, socioeconomic political differences between these countries um, that we need to take into, into account um, when analyzing the region. 
It's also important to understand that the, the diversity um, of the region in terms of farming systems, uh, climate variability, um, and rainfall systems, temperature patterns, and the like. So this, for example, we can utilize data, maps, evidence to assist us understanding the region. Um, and you can have a quick little glimpse here to see what the main uh, food systems are across the region in, in particular countries. And you can, start, you can start using this evidence in your foresight exercise. I'm gonna to have to do a very quick overview of understanding the structures and the policies of the system. Um, but it is important to understand the policy environment um, and the governance structures at play at the static um, institutional level, but also at the member country level. Um, who defines the rules? Who, who are the key players in, in planning and decision-making? And at what, what relevant uh, level? Um, what, what level is relevant for our objective? Um, and it's very important to remember that climate and agriculture visions occur at at multiple levels and transcend multiple scales. So I'm gonna quickly try and illustrate this. For example, we'll all be very um, aware of the, of the varying goals, different objectives and visions that occur, for example, at the global level. So most of us um, have been working in, in, um, along the line of the sustainable development goals. So all of us are very aware of uh, SDG2, for example, that, that looks to eradicate hunger, SDG13, which looks for, uh, towards climate action, um, SDG 14 and 15, life on land and life below, uh, and life below water. And all of these um, goals occur at the highest decision-making level. They're very aspirational uh, and long-term, and, and they seek the voluntary commitments of member countries around the world. So what they try and do is they try and um, look towards a common vision. At this level, um, and, and obviously static, sorry, and what I wanted to say with this is that static member countries are all part of these uh, processes. So each um, SADC member country has uh, global visions that it's also looking to adhere to. The, co the continental le level, which obviously includes SADC member countries as well, at the African Union level, there are 55, or 50, yeah, 55 countries that are looking to um, at how to, to see uh, the agenda 2063, which is the development um, vision for the African Union. How can we all feed into um, accomplishing this vision for the region? And the African Union too has an African development uh, program, which the SADC member countries look, um, uh, look at the vision in order to um, try and feed into. At the SADC, le at the SADC level itself, uh, SADC has a vision 2050, which is um, essentially a, um, a strategic um, or, or development trajectory for SADC, and it lays out uh, the desired goals and future for the region. It's obviously um, incorporates this huge long time frame um, and incorporates all issues across the SADC uh, region broadly. Then what you get here is the Regional Indicative Strategic Development Program. Um, Something that uh, just keep keep in mind because it's really important from a time frames perspective later. But this RISDP is essentially a 15 year roadmap. Um, it's a, the strategic direction and vision for the region, um, and it's and it seeks to try and find common ground for all the member countries in terms of um, development priorities for the region, and it includes obviously um, thematic areas of climate change and agriculture. And then as we work our way down. Um, we get climate change, we get sectoral visions um, for the region. So for example, there's a climate change strategy, which is generally a five-year vision. Um, currently it's being um, sort of renegotiated, but it's at the current climate change uh, strategies from 2015 to 2020. And then you also have regional uh, agricultural policies, et cetera. Um, and those are the visions that member countries uh, try and feed into. At the SADC level, um, this is interesting. This is the organizational um, structure of SADC. Um, and I just wanted to mention this because this is, this is essentially this, where the SADC secretariat, um, this is the, so the SADC, SADC, sorry, the SADC structure is made up of two different functions. Essentially, there's a steering function, which sits at the highest level um, and is made up of uh, heads of state meetings, organs of the secretary, the SADC troika and, and, and high level and decision making at the highest at the highest political level, and then you get the functional responsibility, um, which includes the SADC secretariat, and underneath it all the directorate, which look after the, the thematic areas of SADC. So, for example, the most important to take um, take note of here is the Food and Agriculture and Resources Directorate, which includes um, our thematic areas of food security and agriculture, environment and climate change, and other natural resource areas that are important to us. 
But why it's important to have a, have a look at this more broadly is to have a look, for example, under infrastructure, the directorate that's responsible for infrastructure. There are categories here um, that are of, of relevance to our topic. So we need to do um, a, a scan of, of all the various directors to understand what stakeholders need to be at the table, uh, where the thematic areas sit, so that we know who to include um, and where decisions are made. Um, what I'm trying to show here is obviously, so from the, the static uh, member, um, the 16 uh, static members, each of them um, obviously have national visions. Um, so for example, we've taken three of the countries here and we've, we've spoken about the fact that each of them has a national development plan, which generally uh, goes over about a five year uh, time frame and implementation pl uh, plans and obviously budgetary uh, frameworks that that, um, that accompany them. But all of these visions speak back into the static vision and then speak back into the, the broader visions for the continent and global objectives. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that there are multiple layers and you need to consider how everything fits together um, and that the, there's a huge complexity of the system. Obviously at this level, um, the, the strategic plans are shorter, they're more detailed and they speak directly to the context of countries. And the implementing agents are also different. So for example, um, here you might have decisions being made by an intergovernmental panel for climate change or a council on sustainable development. And at each level, the agencies that make the decisions are different. Here, I try to quickly illustrate the sectoral um, issues and the local levels for uh, local levels implementation. So again, just remember that there's various scales and that um, while, for example, at the local level, these agencies are key for implementation, um, they again speak to the broader visions um, of the national uh, member countries of the region and then upwards. Okay, the next thing that, um, that we have to do is to set a time, setting the timeline. Um, and remember, this is all at the beginning of the foresight exercise um, and all the, all the methods that Sabrina's had to, uh, is trying to describe to date are part of the input stage. So it's always important to just gather information and to understand the context of static. So for, for example, here, foresight planning is often based on timelines of strategic plans and policies that already exist. Um, so current static plans and development, um, developments have already, have already set a mark for the future date of the forecast. So the time horizons provide us with the freedom to think about alternative future. Which existing plans and strategies should we base our timeline on? As I've mentioned, there are multiple. So here, we, here over here, we have um, a lot of the member, um, member uh, strategies rep, um, represented. So for example, the nationally determined contributions to the Paris Agreement at the member country level. But over here, you'll see the SDG framework, which goes up to 2030, the RISDP, which I explained earlier, which has a, a time frame of 2030. But then you get everything from the static vision that goes up to 2050 and the AU agenda, which, which has a time frame of 2063. Essentially for this exercise, um, what we want to, want, what we're going to focus on is what's contained within the RISDP, and uh, this is because this is one of the most important strategic documents for the region. It sets out essentially the plan for strategic um, integration, and um, this already sets up a planning view of 2030. Right, stakeholder mapping. Um, again, this is a process of gathering information about the stakeholders that are, that are important to include. And um, it's essentially a, met a method that we need to, um, we need to use uh, to understand who the main actors are in this agri-food uh, system and how they influence and relate to one another. So for example, let me show you. So for example, we need to understand who are the key stakeholders. So what we've set out to do here, um, you can see that we've taken um, numerous groups of stakeholders um, as per the theme. Um, obviously, this is not exhaustive. There are many other uh, stakeholders and it'll be interesting through this process um, to see you I constantly um, re-evaluating the system to see who needs to be at the table and who has been excluded or who needs to be emphasized in terms of influence. But you'll see that each of these um, thematic um, Oh, oh, sorry, each of these stakeholders is essential in the process um, because they provide different roles. So as you know, for example, a scientific community and academia would provide um, a lot of the knowledge that would be used um, in the region. It, it's it's the, acad the academic and scientific community um, for where we get our evidence that we can base our information and policies on. Um, we've spoken a lot about the government um, to date, which is obviously they provide the policy um, direction and leadership in terms of um, 
setting subsidies, um, is essentially um, um, providing a strategic direction. Um, we know, I mean, there's just a variety of players, but you're all very aware of this and, and you're all from these various stakeholder groups. So you, you're well aware of the varying roles that stakeholders play. And um, what is very in, uh, important to do is to understand the relationships between stakeholders. What are stakeholders giving and what are they getting? And um, in order to do this, you can do a very basic uh, stakeholder mapping exercise yourself with arrows indicating um, these processes. So for example, um, we can see, for example, that the science and the academic community are providing uh, research and development assistance to commercial private players. Or for example, financial institutions provide obviously very important resources, grants and loans to various, various players. Um, we know that governments, for example, um, provide uh, regulations and subsidies to commercial players. So it's very important that, that this exercise maps the, the, um, the variety of uh, vested interests, of relationships, of power dynamics in the system. And then it's very important to question uh, who else needs to be there. So who else needs to be at the table in terms of decision making? Um, so I've identified a couple of categories here, for example, that I find obviously are most important. Um, at the beginning, I showed uh, the youth demographic for the region, and uh, Sadek has got one of the highest youth demographics. And obviously, there's a renewed interest in the youth demographic for interge uh, intergenerational justice issues. Obviously, a lot of youth are left wondering um, what the world, what what we're leaving behind for them. So, the youth are obviously a key stakeholder at the table. Women um, are disproportionately affected um, by the current system and are, are at the shoulder, are shouldering a lot of the risks and the physical burdens of agricultural pro uh, production across static. Um, so it's important to understand that they, they are at the table and that they have equal access to land and other productive resources. Um, we know, for example, it's important to include lo local champions um, and also champions of policy change. So anyway, as you, as you, as you uh, go through the process, it's important to understand who of these stakeholders are missing. And then understanding the relative influence of the different stakeholders. Um, this is obviously important. Um, here we go. This is just a, a quick um, illustration to show how you can map influence. So essentially you list the stakeholders related to the theme up here in little boxes. And then what you do where, the, where you identify stakeholders having um, additional influence or power in the system, you can increase the size of the box just to show that they um, have elevated importance in the system. But we've, we've showed these um, examples because essentially, um, if, if we were in a different scenario and you were all together, you would be doing these, um, mapping, these, doing these mapping exercises yourself to understand uh, the key stakeholders in the system. And then designing your own forecast system. So obviously um, it's important then when you are designing your own forecast process for stakeholders is to understand how many in people do you want to engage? Um, how, how widely do you want to cast the net in terms of participation? And, and which actors you want to include? And obviously this has to be grounded in what's practical. So um, there are obviously key constraints um, to these processes and who's in the room. Um, it, a lot of people have financial constraints. It's not always easy to travel. Um, it can maybe, for example, in a, in a particular context, there might be language barriers or they might be, uh, we have, might have access issues um, to certain people or certain types of sensitive information. Um, so this is just an illustration of how, uh, some of the dynamics that you need to think of when designing uh, the stakeholder map. All right, sorry I had to squeeze through that uh, so quickly. We just, I, I'm aware that we're running out of time, um, but maybe we can open for Q and A. Thank you so much to Sabrina and Romy. Um, we have plowed through the scope. And um, at this moment, what we'd like to do is invite some questions, uh, brief questions. And I would invite people to actually raise your hand on your um, participant panel and just raise your hand. If you have an intervention, we'd love to hear from some of you in the, um, that we can't see, okay? So um, perhaps we, oh good, we've got a couple already. And I would ask that we call on Jessica Thorne. And I just remind you to keep your question brief. Thank you. 
Hello. Um, it's been really very interesting and fascinating. So thank you everybody for this very well organized seminar. Um, I'm just curious, a simple question in terms of process as to when you conduct these, when you're running the stakeholder act, actor network mapping and the influence mapping, when do you do that? Some people do it before the forecasting and sometimes they do it as a, a more participatory process. Um, so, and, and with whom do you do that if you're doing it beforehand? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, Romy, would you like to address that? I think I'm going to, uh, Sabrina, because just in terms of process, uh, it might be best um, that you, yeah, that you mentioned when, when you would do that. Sure, no problem. And thanks so much, Jessica. Great, great question. Um, and, and actually, this is quite, quite difficult in terms of trying to convey the training framework that about engagement processes running through, um, through very differently. And I think what Romy was trying to summarize there at the end is, um, often we have to prioritize um, from considerations such as like finances, resources, timing, when do we bring specific people in and, and when not? Because ideally, obviously, we want to be very participatory, but um, um, how do we do this and when we, when we do this? That's why we've suggested in your scope, initially would be within your team. So it would be essentially um, whoever's part of your foresight team. So if it's a project or you're gathering a certain number of ministers or, or people working in a, in, a, in a district or you know extension officers whoever's in your sort of foresight planning um, process you would gather them to already from their knowledge put together the the initial stakeholder map um, and so that would be I guess not as participatory um, as process it would be more based on knowledge um, and and you can you can show this to various people and say uh, do we have the right stakeholders is this who we're thinking of and then you can actually also, these are iterative processes, so you build your stakeholder map and then you often go back to your theme and you unpack your theme a bit more because you're like, you, you just saw Romy there said, women need to be more at the table and youth need to be more at the table. And did we have those as considerations in our theme? And so, so you go back even in your scope saying, do we know what we're doing? Um, Constance um, next week is going to really kind of unpack systems mapping. And a big part of that is when you understand the system, you then actually dive back into stakeholder analysis to say we're starting to understand who's there and who's not. And in our third webinar, we, we, we discuss the tool of causal analysis. And this is really taking a deep dive on like why are things happening? And when that happens, actually your stakeholder map becomes quite wide. And that's often when you do a more participatory process and say, why is this happening? Why do we have the kind of same issues? So um, basically engagement and, and those processes happen along the way but um, I hope I've answered that, that this initial stage is often more internal and as you do the other methods you then maybe strategize and say okay we're now going to kind of invest in a more participatory stakeholder engagement process. Thank you so much for that. Um, I had a question from Sandil. Sandil, um, we'd like to give you the floor. Sandil? Sandile. Sandile, thank you for that. <laughs> I think Brava. it's Sandile. Sandile Pierre, you should be able to unmute your microphone now. So you should find a microphone icon if you are on the laptop at the top, at the bottom left of the screen. Otherwise, we've got Olaf, uh, um, who, is already, who also raised the end uh, and uh, already is, is unmuted. So maybe um, we can go to Olaf first while we'll sort out Sandile's mic. Um, can anybody hear me now? Sandile, yeah, okay. yes. Okay, yes, yes. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to find out when you, when you do, um, I guess, for both uh, from a planning, from a forecasting perspective, and also from a stakeholder identification perspective, when you do the uh, stakeholder analysis um, and defining of the scope, how do you how do you cater for um, external variables that have a serious influence or great impact on the effort that's done internally in the scope that's been chosen? Uh, for, for the planning or for practicality or for prioritization um, in such a way that if you, if you identify those variables, they balloon 
your system to a point where it's difficult to manage. But on the other hand, if you don't uh, consider those variables on the basis of the boundary of the system, whatever you do may have um, be uh, may be impacted by external variables that you don't have control over because you have limited your system into a particular geography. That uh, so, I, I, like for instance, in agricultural production systems, food that we produce in Southern Africa could be driven by Americans or the UK or somebody else. And therefore, unless we, we have a full understanding of what goes on in the US in terms of food demands, um, we, we can never really put a, a hand over what we are doing or trying to manage uh, locally. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Sandile. An excellent question. Great Sabrina? Question. I, can, I can try and take a stab at it. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, like, brilliant question. And I think um, um, it's... It's, it's really difficult because, I mean, I think just expanding on that scope, if you looked at the agri-food system, it would be like, whoa, okay, now, now we have to try and find data and evidence and we have to find stakeholders that represent all these components. Our, 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 our foresight exercise is suddenly looking really huge and unmanageable. Um, but why we do that in the scope is that we've, again, just reiterating that foresight is like a, it's a change in thinking, that it's envisioning that in the future, these different components might play out in a very different way. And I think you've actually, you've discussed um, what we would, we would call a driver um, for external food systems and consumption. For example, um, trade, trade patterns from overseas, how does that impact us regionally? Um, and then you really try and unpack. So we, 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 will, we will be sort of building on each of these methods as we go along, because in your, in your scenario process, you have to actually really define which are the most like the high impact and most uncertain drivers. So in that case, if you were looking at a food system or if you were looking at a trade and um, the future of trade, you might actually pick like international um, demand or consumption patterns would be one of your most high impact drivers. And then you would sort of unpack a future state like that. Um, so yeah, I think a really, really good question. And we'll try and make sure I've registered in my notes that we'll, we'll try and make sure that uh, especially next week, uh, where we unpacked how do you start with the analysis phase, where we look at horizon scanning and trends analysis, how you can, you, you broaden out from this scope and you use those tools to really say what are the historical or what are the trends and what are the trends going forward. So you take, you take both views. So I hope, um, I hope that's done a tiny answer to that, but it's a very good intervention for us to keep coming back to. Thank you so much. Um, Olaf, please. Thank you, Constance. Uh, no, very interesting and uh, very useful. So I think my question is related, and I think it's put both of you, Romy and Sabrina, is related to this link between this very complex region and then bringing in the, the different context at different levels. So you can bring in, how do you, so I think one is related to the stakeholders. So you talked about youth and women, so, so that could be you know, how do you bring in and empower those to have a voice? And also communities and, and farmers, smallholder farmers, how do you bring that in in such a complex setting of, of large-scale institutions? So, so I think that's one. And the other one to Romy is, 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 so you are doing planning at regional level. So how do you bring in not only national context, but also then districts and, and local context into that? I know it's very complex, but... Just curious, yeah, thank you. Uh, Romy, do you want me to take the first part and you can yeah. take the second part? Yeah, um, Olaf, great question, because I think that, that sits in our minds a lot where we, uh, we can be in a, um, a very controlled planning setting with a, with a set of, of stakeholders or people. Um, just some maybe practical evidence from a foresight exercise we did up in, um, in Northern Kenya, actually, in a, in a very sort of dry land context where we were helping to build a five-year development plan with the, with the government. Um, we, we really spend a lot of time basically unpacking and, and, and changing the public participation process. Because I think, um, you know, feeding in um, voices from, from maybe even sort of the village level, etc. So we changed there where it would be more that they, they selected a number of districts and then they gathered, um, you know, 20 people. And, and the problem was those people were often selected by either a ward councillor that maybe knew those people, et cetera. So although it was public participation on paper, it was not maybe 
bringing in the voices and we we sort of encouraged through this sort of foresight planning like if we need to plan five or ten years ahead how can we change that and so what we did was actually partner with Caritas um, in terms of like a, a partner that works at very village um, and through the churches and, and can be seen in, in that setting, it was applicable. And I'm not saying um, always like, a, 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 um, you know, these different partners that have to be very context specific. And then we were able to gather inside and voices. So after church sessions, after local village gatherings, et cetera, and that all constituted part of a much more expanded public participation process that was endorsed and kind of driven by the government and even kind of funded. So that, that was a sort of change in maybe a structure of how you would gather in, um, get in evidence from different levels, but in a more structured way. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, and if I can just add, I think similarly, um, in terms of making sure that that uh, local level or district level is, is represented, um, I mean, this could be done where a national body um, made sure that stakeholders at the, at the district or local level were represented within its, within its, within its uh, planning or decision making, um, making sure that they are participatory in and of itself. Um, but I think often the, we do often miss the voice of um, the implementing agency. So at the, at the at the municipal level or at the city's level. Um, so I think one of the other things exactly like Sabrina said is making sure that their voices are heard and then going through some of the capacity constraints and issues at that level, um, which is often neglected when you when you start looking at uh, at a higher re regional level. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, shall we take time to do at least one question that's in the chat? And I realize that we're not going to be able to answer all the questions during our time frame to stay on time. So um, I think there is a question that's been um, posed uh, uh, from Wendy. And um, it was about where in the planning process would it be ideal to use some of these foresight tools, um, especially if you're looking at how to increase the participation of youth in SADAC, um, in the future food systems, and the role youth can play in building climate resilience. Um, Sabrina, do you want to take a Sure, I'd actually response? just responded. I just responded in the text. <laughs> to, to Wendy and I said, you said that's a great question, actually, a great um, um, case study we could unpack next week in terms of when you do your analysis and you start to interpret, because interpretation is really what's happening. And that's often where we really spark um, which voices are we not hearing and who is not included and how do we do that? Um, so I, I fear in just a minute, I would not really give this justice. But if you're happy and we can share some contact details, if you can expand a bit more on that question, we can actually build an example about it next week. Um, that would be my suggestion, but we can also, um, following on the webinar, all the questions that we have not answered in detail, we will make sure that we are going to send a, a question and answer summary um, to those. So I'm not, not answering it, but I think it's a great question that we can actually expand onto as an example, if that's okay. And as we go forward, um, wonderful. So I think with the, the time we are now, um, if I could um, just also talk a little bit about where we are in our process and preparing for the next one. Um, one of the things has been some really interesting uh, ideas put forward and some additions into the chat box and we're gonna wanna take those into account. People are talking about, um, can we get um, unpack the risks when we're doing our scope. And also people are looking at uncertainty and noting that it really happens at different levels. And we've seen from the chat box that people are working very much from a local to national, local to local, and local to national to region. So we have been, we have been through our foresight stages. And just to remind you, We've spent this webinar on looking at the input. Point. Um, we have a, a better understanding of the stages of the foresight process and of those key terms, as well as understanding of the dimensions of the agri-food system and climate resilience, our theme. Um, 
we have focused in on the input stage and set the scope for a foresight exercise. Um, we are going to focus on analysis and interpretation. We'll be looking at trend analysis, horizon scanning, evidence, as well as systems mapping and cross-sectoral and multi-stakeholder approaches. And we'll be taking a number of the comments that you've made into account in the next one. So we're very much going to be about understanding the regional trends, multi-sectoral and stakeholder linkages, and climate risks in the region. So I want to thank all of our participants and thank all of our speakers. Um, we would like to invite a ticket out per se before you sign off. Um, in the chat box, can we invite you to, um, if you wish to identify a key learning from today, and if you want to put an L beside that as you, as you type it in, or if you have a comment back to the training team, um, something that you want us to pay attention to um, as we prepare for next week's workshop. Um, we, we very much would like to see you know, any learnings or any comments that you have for us. And we want to thank you very much. As I understand it, we are also going to leave uh, the room open for just a few minutes. And so that if there is some networking that needs to take place or additional follow-up questions or thoughts. And with that, may I invite those entries into the chat box on learnings or comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We greatly appreciate the feedback. And um, I think that um, we have truly enjoyed being with you today and we look forward to next week. And we also look forward to um, more and more interaction. So with that, thank you so much. Have a lovely time between now and next week. Thank you, Constance. It's Pierre Andrea here. It's great to see the comments and the question, the comment and the learning coming in the chat. So we still have about 50 people in the room. Uh, please feel free to keep chatting or, as uh, Constance said, also posing any additional question, and we'll make sure they will they're going to be addressed after the webinar. Sure. And I, I just uh, prompt uh, for those left in the room. Still, we're seeing some really good questions of things they want to hear in terms of application or, or real examples, etc. That would be great. And uh, if you, uh, especially to try and tailor this to, to you as participants, if you have any kind of sticky questions or projects or, um, you know, something you're actually pondering right now in your work, it would be really great to try and apply some of the tools and methods to that. So please feel free if there's, um, if there's a context or a, or a theme um, that you're working on that we can, uh, we can look to kind of really embed the method and tool, just let us know. And we, we hope to all see you next week. Thank you again, one and all, and we appreciate very much your joining us.
Um, Irene, absolutely. I've just seen a question about the slides. And um, if you just scroll up, Lily has put the um, the address for where all the resources will be put on the CCAF's website. So this is where we will be sharing um, resources following each of the webinars um, and a link to the to the recordings, etc. Um, so please just scroll up there. And, and Lily's also left her email address if there's any questions or follow up um, for the information. Yes, same time, same station, but will be a different invite link. So uh, you'll receive another a separate email invitation to join the session. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week and have a lovely rest of your evening. Bye. Thank you, Costas. I'm stopping the recording now.